All right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Hello and a welcome aboard. Welcome aboard to everyone. Lakeisha McKnight is here. We're getting ready for the start of the virtual Bible study. So I know Facebook is informing many of you that we're live. I know we're live on Spreaker, iHeartRadio. We're over at the leadershiptkostation.com's website. And so I just want to welcome everyone, men and women alike. Welcome to this session. All right, so I'm going to definitely ease my way into this. I'm not going to rush. I'm going to allow it to flow. All right, I'm going to allow this to flow. So welcome aboard. It's about 8.34 a.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. Okay. 8.34 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so we're going to get started momentarily. So I'm super duper excited about the information to be shared and to be reviewed today. So welcome. So the virtual Bible study, we do this every single morning around 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, except on Sundays. So on Sundays, we don't have the virtual Bible study. And, and the reason for this virtual Bible study really is to help men and women alike to learn how to win from the inside out. That's really the goal, helping you to win from the inside out, helping you to, to understand more about who you are and being able to walk in, in God's will, his, his assignment for your life. That's what it's really all about. Okay. And so just want to inform you of that. Now you can continue to do what you normally do, your one-on-one -on -one time with God and definitely connecting with other believers in person. But if you want that extra dose every single morning, just about, uh, you're more than welcome to join me here on the platform. So welcome. So there are a few ways that you can be involved and that you can engage. Number one, love the stream. If you know that you know that you know that the word of God is powerful and can transform lives, click on that love button. Number two, we do have the comments feature so we can share our thoughts. You can type things in the comments area, comments and ask questions in that area as well. And then lastly is the share feature. So you can go ahead and share this on your timeline, a group, a fan page, wherever it is you want to share it. Uh, because I believe that one of the assignments we do have as believers is to continue to share the good news. Okay. With those who are willing to listen, you know, share the good news message. All right. And so that's simple, right? Takes a couple of seconds to do. So what happens when we're here on the platform? I will give you a heads up. We'll be here for maybe about 45 minutes or so, okay? And simply being, we have a two-part focus with the Bible study. Now, let me explain what happens. So we're here on the platform. We go over these guidelines. We're about to pray just to get ourselves prepared. Uh, after prayer, we will dive into part number one, which is continual reading, right, of the New Testament. So we're going to finish up Luke chapter 15. We're specifically going to be studying verses 11 through 32, okay, 11 through 32 of Luke 15. Uh, we're going to assess, you know, what encouraged Luke to include these verses and, you know, how do we actually apply these verses to our lives? We want to definitely make the word practical. So that's what we're going to do there. I uh, will summarize what we've gone over, okay, in the scripture, and then we're going to transition. We're going to dig into another kingdom concept. That's part two of the virtual Bible study. Uh, and the concept that we're going to focus in on is citizenship. Okay. Citizenship. What does it mean? Okay. What does it truly mean? So let's get ourselves prepared, gather our beings together. Right. And so let's go ahead. We're going to start with prayer. So father in heaven, we thank you so very much for this day. We thank you, father. This is truly the day you've made and we will continue to rejoice and be glad in this day. We thank you. There are some people, father, we know that may not have made it, but you saw fit for us to be here another day. We thank you for that. And so, Lord, you know, we just humbly come before your throne of grace, just expressing our love for you. God, we love you. We truly do. 
We thank you so very much for how you've watched over us, how you've protected us, how you've guided us. We thank you so very much for how you've provided for us, God, day in and day out. We thank you for you being King of Kings and Lord of Lords, for you being Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God who provides. We thank you. We thank you for being our peace, Jehovah Shalom, God. We thank you so much. We thank you. And so even in this moment, we're, we're grateful for this technology that enables us to come together like this. And we're just asking, Father, that you would forgive us of all sin, cleansing our hearts and our minds of everything, God, that we've said or done that has not pleased you. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord. Guide us in this moment as we're together, and, but in various places. Help us to gain knowledge, understanding, and wisdom as we read this word. Most importantly, help us to rightly divide the word of truth, understanding and applying it the way you would have us to apply it. And so, God, we thank you for everyone that's going to be listening in live and for those who may catch the replay. And so we truly thank you for it all, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right. So hopefully you all are ready. All right. Hopefully you all are indeed ready. So, okay. So 15, Luke 15, starting at verse 11. Here we go. It says, then he, Jesus said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, I repeat, he when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here, and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the, to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked, what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a, a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this young this son of yours came, 
who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, let's take a closer look at this. Of course, somewhat resembling the other parable. Somewhat, okay, somewhat. So we're going to take a look. So this, some people call this the parable of the prodigal son. And it's interesting because um, for those who really want to know, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a movie buff. So <laughs> there is a movie, a Christian movie, um, actually created around this particular parable. Really, really good. Really, really good. Kind of gives you somewhat of a visual uh, of what this may look like. Okay. But it's the parable of the prodigal son. Okay, it's really the most familiar, familiar one and beloved, really, of all of the parables that, that Jesus really shared. It's one of the longest, most, I should say, detailed ones as well. It has more than one lesson, though, to it, which is really good. See, the prodigal, in this particular instance here, is an example of, of really, the heart of this is really sound repentance. It's about repentance. You see, the elder brother, in this case, actually pictures really the issue, the, how should I put it, being real straight, the wickedness of the Pharisees in their self-righteousness, right? Their prejudice, their, really their indifference towards repenting sinners. That's how the older brother kind of, that the older brother represents those, those religious leaders. And the father actually represents God you know, being eager to forgive us, you know, longing for the return of the sinner. Like, and understand the main feature, just like in the other parables, you know, is really the joy of God, right? Celebrations that fill heaven with, with a sinner who actually repents, right? Repentance is at the heart and at the core of this. But even more specifically, if we were to look at this and kind of break down the different parts and what we actually saw, you know, even this younger son, right? Verse 12, and it said the younger son, the younger of them said to his father, you know, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, right? It may be considered a shocking request, Right? saying he wished his father was actually dead. Like he was not really entitled to any inheritance while his father still lived. Okay? The father graciously fulfilled the request giving him his, his portion, which would have been one about a third, I would say around about a third of the entire estate. You know, because the right, you know, because the right of the firstborn gave the elder brother a double portion. And this really acts this, this act here, this situation, this picture, kind of gives us an idea of all sinners related to God the Father by creation who, who waste their potential privileges and refuse any relationship with him, choosing instead a life of sinful self-indulgence. Okay? Sinful self-indulgence. And looking at verse 13 where it talks about, and not many days after, the younger son get, gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and they were wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Okay? Hold on, you all. Give me one quick moment. All right, so even looking at this, I'm back, guys. Even looking at this, verse 13, where it says, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions 
with prodigal living. So this son, this prodigal son, you know, evidently he took his share in liquid assets. He left. He actually abandoned his father and he headed into a life, pretty much a life of sin. A life of sin. And it speaks of prodigal living, right? Prodigal living. So we're just not talking about wasteful, extravagant, extravagant living. We're talking about straight <laughs> immorality uh, that was going on. Okay, prodigal meaning like just kind of like dissolute. It just gives you this idea of just this crazy lifestyle. I'm just it sounds really light, but it's a crazy lifestyle that he began to engage in. All right, but notice a, a severe famine came on the land, and he began to be in want after he had spent all and wasted all. Okay, and then he went to try to join himself to a citizen of another country, right? And so he was desperate. He was really, really desperate. See, his situation could hardly have been any more desperate than this. See, it symbolizes the 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 strange sinner at this particular point who is really helpless in despair. Helpless in despair. But notice one thing that I emphasized when I was reading uh, in verse 17 where it says, but when he came to himself, when he came to himself, right? So in other words, when he came to his senses, when he came to his senses, when when his his sinning, right, had left him bankrupt, it left him hungry, he was really able to think clearer. He was able to think clearly. And in this con condition here, he was a candidate for salvation. He was willing and open to hear and to truly listen. Look at verse 18, though. He says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Right? So he carefully contemplated this. You know, what he would actually say and, and counted the cost of his repentance. He counted the cost. See, he not only realized the, the fertility of his situation, but he also understood the gravity of his, of his sins against his father, too. And look at verse 20. He arose once his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Okay, so obviously the father had been really waiting and looking for his son to actually return. And he ran to him. Notice what he did, right? He ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So even the father's eagerness, his joy at his son's return is unmistakable. Okay, this is like a, an amazing, amazing trait of God that sets him apart from, from, any, from anything else. Okay, he is not indifferent. He is not hostile. He's a savior by nature, right? A savior by nature, longing to see every sinner, okay, every sinner repent and, and rejoicing actually when they do that. OK, God desires for all men to be saved. He has been and will be seeking to save many, many sinners, you know, and rejoices every single time a person repents and is converted. He rejoices every time, every time. OK, but notice what the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Okay? So the father is pouring out his love for his son. He expresses his joy that that was lost, but actually being that his son was lost, now he's found. Okay? So each of the father's gifts said something actually unique as well. Think about it. The robe, right, is actually, you know, really reserved for the guest of honor. Then you have like the ring, which is a symbol of authority. OK, the ring is like a symbol of authority. And then you have sandals. Now, these these were not usually worn by, quote unquote, you know, those who are, you know, not of, of great value. Or I should say even slaves. It wasn't worn by slaves, but it signified his full restoration to sonship. That's what the sandals re represent. OK, and even when he he requested for the fatted calf, normally this is reserved only for the most special of occasions. A celebration. Okay? So really all of this symbolizes the the importance of salvation and celebrating when one comes into a relationship with the Father. 
Now, we already know that in this instance, the older son represents or even symbolizes here the Pharisees. You know, the hypocritical religious person who stays close to the place of the father, right? But really has no sense of sin, no real love for the father at all, and no real interest in seeing sinners repent at all. No real interest whatsoever. Okay? But notice something very important. Verse 29. He answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. So he goes on. He explains all this, right? Okay. So, see, this actually reveals, okay, this reveals the problem with those who are extremely religious. Okay. They will not recognize their sin, right? And they won't repent. Again, they will not rep recognize their sin and they won't repent. You see, the elder son, the eldest son here, his comment, it just, man, it just, it just symbolizes the spirit of, of the Pharisees. It really does. It really, really does. See, all the years of service to the father appear to have been motivated by this elder brother too much by a concern, you know, of, of what he can get for himself. And the son's, this self-righteous behavior of his was more acceptable than, socially acceptable, I can say, than the, than the younger brother's, um, lavish living that he was engaging in okay but it was equally dishonoring to the father and 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 really it called for repentance as well you know both behaviors uh really needed repentance it really did and one point one other point that i would make here okay one other point even from you know looking at verse 31 where it says and he said to him son you are always with me and all that I have is yours. See, the inheritance it had already been distributed. You know, everything the father had was literally in, in the elder son's possession. But the elder son, you know, was begrudging. You know, even the love of the father showed to the prodigal son. So the Pharisees and the scribes had easy access. They really did to, to all the riches of God's truth, but they spent their lives dealing with scripture and public worship. They never really possessed any of the treasures and joy, you know, by the repentant sinner. So because they didn't have a heart of repentance, they didn't really enjoy it. Okay. They didn't really enjoy it. So hopefully you all are seeing as we broke some of this down a bit, you know, you see the bigger picture, you know, heaven and the father in heaven rejoicing for that one that's found meaning the one that has repented, right? Repented and, and, and desired a true relationship with him. That's what it's all about, right? That's what it's all about. I always tell the story. I got stories for days. <laughs> I promise I will not tell like a bazillion stories. Um, and here's the beautiful thing. Uh, you know, everybody's situation, everybody's time of, of transformation is different. You know, everybody has what is... Some people say the quote unquote Damascus experience where their life is completely changed, you know, and they come and have a relationship with God. And I, I remember that distinctly. You know, a lot of people know, you know, that I was raised, you know, with that type of background, right? But it's nothing like, I mean, you can go to church for years, right? And truly not understand. It can be going in one ear and out the next. But when you have a heartfelt desire, to want to have a relationship with God, heartfelt, it makes a difference. And that's when transformation begins to take place. And I know for me, you know, I, because, and I know, and I sit back and I think about it, I'm like, God, he had to, he had to be strategic with me, uh, simply because he knows that I'm a people person, right? I'm a people person, not saying that I got to be around people all the time, but I'm a people person. So, you know, for me, the situation was, um, I was in school, I was in college and, you know, he began to slowly and I, and I, now that I sit back and I, I sit back and I think about this, he began to slowly remove individuals out of my life. And I'm like, what is <laughs> going on? You know, I had a close friend, right? She ended up moving back to Philly and it was just, it was just, it was just crazy in my perspective, <laughs> the way that it all happened, um, which left me in a position of connecting with a group 
of, of women. It was men, of course, but it's a group through a, through a sorority, a Christian sorority, uh, which took me again through a process of really understanding what it meant to have a personal relationship with God. And really that was the emphasis of personal relationship with God and walking in the power of God. You know, and so he will use anything. <laughs> he will use anything to try to grab your attention. You know, he will do that. But I, I can honestly say I'm grateful and thankful for the things that he did because it helped me to, to really cherish having a relationship. There's nothing on earth. There's nothing more valuable than having a personal relationship with God. Nothing. Nothing. I don't care. And is the any possessions thing? There's nothing that can convince me that having you know not having a relationship with God is is worth it. You need one. You just you just need one. It's like air that you breathe. You just need to have it. You need to have a relationship. All right. So I do want to transition, okay, and begin to talk about this kingdom concept, okay, this kingdom concept. All right. Here we go. So we're going to talk a little bit about citizenship, okay? We're going to talk a little bit about citizenship. Uh, okay, here we are. Here we are, here we are. Okay. So let's talk about it. You know, this concept of, of citizenship, and hopefully you all have a piece of paper and a pen because I might you know, drop a couple of golden nuggets because they're really, really good. So this concept of citizenship is really important to understanding like the nature of the kingdom of heaven. So understand all governments, kingdoms, they operate on laws and principles. We got that part, right? Hopefully we have that part. But citizenship is, is necessary. It really is for the legitimacy of a nation. And citizenship is really the most sacred privilege of a nation. So citizen, citizenship it has, it has great power and it has privileges at the same time. So this is why people are willing to risk their lives, even to cross borders, even to the point of death, to pursue the hope of citizenship. And so it's, it's not only sacred, but, but it's sanctified as well. You know, set apart. You know, a citizen is part of a, like an elite privileged group. People people who have lived as quote unquote what subjects for a foreign government rather than citizens understanding the distinct the dis this distinction much better than people who are really born citizens. So it's true for people who have worked very hard to really earn the privilege to become a naturalized citizen, you know, of their chosen country. And I know there's a process for every country too. So it's it's really the most precious gift that any nation can really give okay and it's too precious a treasure to hand out you know indiscriminately meaning without certain requirements too okay so when it comes to the matter of citizenship the kingdom of god is 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 really no different from any other country now the kingdom of god is not a religion we established that too right it's a government with a country Again, it's a government with a country. You see, heaven is that country. And Jesus Christ, or I should say Jesus the Christ, because Christ is not his last name. You got to make sure I clarify that. <laughs> Jesus the Christ is its king. Okay? So referring referring to Christ you know, even the prophet, he actually wrote, it was Isaiah the prophet, he wrote something specific. He said to this, he said this in his chapter, chapter nine, he says, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, right? The government will be on his shoulders. Do you guys see that? Of the increase of his government in peace, there will be no end. He will reign and on David's throne. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And if you're trying to figure out specifically the verses, it's Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. 
So the kingdom of God has the principle of citizenship. Okay, it really, really does. And just like the example of America, you know, once people know about the kingdom and once they understand what it is and what it has to offer, they I mean, they clamor to get in. You know, this is what Jesus was referring to when he said specifically the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. Everyone is forcing his way into it. This is actually in Luke 16. Okay, everyone is forcing his way. So once people learn about the kingdom of God, they can't wait to get in. They can't wait to get in. Picture in your mind all those who will be like immigrants, desperately clamoring to cross the border, right? And then you will see what Jesus meant. See, why then someone would ask, do we, do we not see people clamoring to really get into the churches? Why don't we see this? Why? Why does the church, right, as a whole, seem to have little impact, you know, on our culture? Here's the reason. It's simple and it's sad at the same time. You see, many, many, or I should say most, most pastors don't understand the kingdom. Again, most pastors do not understand the kingdom, so they don't preach it. They don't teach it. They don't preach it. They don't teach it. As a result, most people in the churches don't understand the key, the kingdom either. Okay, they don't. So they don't model kingdom living. They don't model it. Okay. So such is the power, you know, of the law of citizenship in the in the kingdom of heaven. So let's talk about becoming a kingdom citizen. Let's talk about it. You see, all nations, including kingdoms, have citizens, right? We already established that point. All nations require immigration status. The kingdom of God is really no different. Okay, the kingdom of God is really no different. Every kingdom citizen today is a naturalized citizen. Okay, every kingdom citizen today is a naturalized citizen. We immigrated, I should say, from a foreign country. In, in, in this sense, it's a dominion of, of darkness, where we as a race, we have been exiled ever since Adam's rebellion in the Garden of Eden. So the human race, we lost citizenship in heaven. We lost our citizenship because we lost our kingdom. And we lost our kingdom because we lost our property, our territory. Now, don't forget that without territory, there is no kingdom. We mentioned that a couple days ago. Without territory, there is no kingdom at all. And without a kingdom, there can be no kingdom citizenship. So when Jesus actually started his ministry, he announced that the kingdom of heaven had arrived. And really, that was the only message he preached. And we emphasize that, you know, even as we're going through some of the, you know, the gospel accounts. That was the only message he preached. He brought back to, to earth the kingdom. That's what he did. He brought back to earth the kingdom that we lost in Eden. He gave us access to it again. So we entered the kingdom of heaven through the process that Jesus called being born again. Right? Being born again. And it's the most gracious feeling. Man, I, I wish I was here for about another hour. I would just share with you that experience. You know, this whole thing about being born again, changing our mind and turning from our rebellion against God, placing our trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our rebellion. This is the process to being born again, changing our mind. How do we do that? Turning from our rebellion against God. Okay, turning from that, placing our trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our rebellion. Okay, and acknowledging him. That's why the word says, if you believe in your heart and confess, acknowledging him as Lord or owner of our lives, owner of our lives. See, this new birth gets us into the kingdom of heaven. This new birth 
gets us into the kingdom of heaven. So many believers call this being saved. Okay, but I, you know, I think it's more helpful really to think of the new birth as the naturalization process by which we become kingdom citizens. Okay, so the new birth makes us naturalized citizens of the kingdom. So also, you know, it also really naturalizes us in a sense that it returns us to our original natural state of authority. Remember, we, we were trying to get back to that state. So it returns us to this natural state of authority and dominion over the earth as God intended for us from the start. Now, when we become citizens of God's kingdom, it means that we voluntarily align ourselves with a new government in a new country and we're embracing its language right? Language, its ideals, its values. So remember the constitution, the kingdom constitution, you know, is really, really specific regarding our citizenship. Just like it said in Ephesians 2.19, it said it, it says, you know, consequently, you are no longer foreigners. Again, you are no longer foreigners, aliens, but fellow citizens. Get that citizens with God's people and members of God's household. This is Ephesians 2 19. He also says something in, and it's also mentioned in Philip in um, Philippians 3 20, where it says our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. I mean, there are a couple of scriptures, if you want to also take note of Colossians 1, verses 12 and 13. You can go back and read that one as well um, during your leisure. So not only does a new birth make us citizens of heaven, but our citizenship begins immediately. Immediately. We're, we're kingdom citizens right now. Our citizenship is a present reality. You know, we are fellow citizens with God's people. Our citizenship is in heaven. You know, God has brought us into the kingdom of the Son. So why is this so important? Some people ask, why is it so important that we know this? Now, here is why. Here is the reason why. Religion postpones citizenship to the future. Get that. Get that. Religion postpones citizenship to the future. Religious leaders tell their people, you will be a citizen someday. <laughs> you will be in the kingdom. You will have joy later. You will be a full citizen, but not today, not yet. <laughs> the kingdom has not yet come. That's what it sounds like when they say certain things. Think about it, but they're wrong. The kingdom has come. Kingdom citizenship has never been postponed. It's never postponed. The kingdom of God is present. It's functional right here on the earth right now. If you have been born again, then you have been naturalized and, and are, you're really a kingdom citizen right now. And that means that all the rights, all the benefits, all the privileges of kingdom citizenship are yours right now. You can enjoy your, your citizenship right now. You don't have to wait until some infinite, indefinite time in the future. Okay, you can never appropriate, you know, really what you postpone. That's why, that's why you call locking up the kingdom of God. That's what you call locking up the kingdom of God to those who, who want to get in right? It is for this reason that I'm actually convinced that the greatest enemy of the kingdom is religion. It's religion. You see, religion keeps, keeps pushing the kingdom away from people, right? And so people actually suffer as a result. That's why so many religious people, you know, they live defeated. You know, they live, they live frustrated lives, and we all know this. We we might have people who are, who are related we're related to that just really religious, right? And they live frustrated lives. They believe that they have to wait for their reward. They have to wait on it. But they don't. 
because you can take advantage of citizenship right now, right now. And so I'm going to talk more on this, this concept of citizenship. I don't want to cram all of it into this one time, but understand something. The moment you believe and you confess, you accept Jesus, you know, as Lord of your life, owner of your life. That's the moment that you become a kingdom citizen and you can enjoy all the privileges, all the benefits right now. No need to wait. Okay, no need to wait. And hopefully you have gleaned a lot. Okay, hopefully you've gleaned a lot from what we shared, uh, not only from, you know, talking about citizenship, but also uh, the first part. The first part. So we need to rejoice. Rejoice in all ways when a person, you know, returns into a loving relationship. Uh, with the father. I, I, I mean, that's just one of those things that just, it touches my heart so much, you know, it, almost to the point where it becomes a little overwhelming <laughs> at times. It really does. Um, but it's just great. It's just great. And, uh, yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna leave it at that. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to pray so that we can be dismissed and and whatever it is that you've gleaned from today yes whatever you've gleaned something that stood out to you the most feel free to share that below in the comment section i would love to hear your thoughts uh, regarding it i really really would all right so let us pray so father in heaven lord thank you so much for this time that you've given us to come together though we may be physically miles and miles away we're still connected. Everyone who is a believer connected because we are members of the body, the body of Christ. And so God, we thank you so much for this time, this opportunity to study your word, to become doers of the word as a result of understanding it. God, we, we rejoice when our family, friends, and others come into a right relationship with you because we know that that is your heart. And we just pray that you would use us as, as vessels so that we can share the love of God with others. Love, help us to be patient, help us to be kind, help us to endure all things. The greatest of these three, you said, in the word is love. And so God, may we love harder than we have ever done before. And so God, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us. And we just pray. We pray for our children. We pray that you would just cover them and cover our family members, our other family members as well, that you continue to do a work in their lives and do a work in our lives. Help us to be the men and the women you've called us to be. Help us to be, uh, for those fellows here, the husbands and the ladies, help, help us to be the wives you've called us to be. Help us to walk in your will uh, for, our, for our lives and to be able to clearly hear your voice. So we thank you for this opportunity. And even for those who may be single, Father, help those who are single to be able to walk in singleness, loving on you and, and really walking in your perfect will for their lives as well. And so we thank you for this opportunity. And we just pray that you would continue to get the glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen and amen. All right, everyone. You know it. Go out and love, love, love even harder. You know, some people designate this day as being Valentine's Day. But many of you already know my heart. You already know it every day. <laughs> you know that I love you. <laughs> and God loves you all the more. Be blessed, everyone, and have a great day.